So I'm gonna start with Daryl. Daryl, tell us why things are so bad in Washington. How much time do you have? <laughs> yeah, five minutes. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for organizing this and Andy for hosting uh, this uh, venue. You know, when you think about it, it's really been an amazing week in Washington, D.C. because Congress finally passed health care, uh, a historic achievement. It's been 50 years in the making, and I think everybody uh, understands what a uh, difficult journey uh, that was. But we, despite the passage of health care reform, we still have a huge problem with government and with our political uh, system. Uh, our system is broken. Uh, we still are awaiting action on many other important pieces of uh, legislation, uh, climate change, financial regulation, immigration reform, and a host of other issues. And when you think about what the problem is, to respond directly to your question, it seems to me there are several different aspects uh, that uh, need attention. One is uh, problems of Congress, just the declining institutional performance that we see. Uh, the rules are crazy. We basically, in the Senate, have moved from majority rule to supermajority rule because of 60 votes needed to cut off a filibuster. What a lot of people don't understand is just how much more frequently bills are being filibustered. For example, if you go back to the 1960s, there was an average of six or seven filibusters per year. Last year, there were 130. And so, basically, because of the filibuster, we now need an unusual majority, 60 votes out of 100, to pass any legislation, or even to uh, get people confirmed, or uh, to uh, take basic action on the part of that institution, and you simply can't meet that threshold. As a supermajority requirement is devastating for any political system. So that's something that we need to uh, change uh, right away. The atmosphere of extreme political polarization, the hyper-partisanship uh, that we've seen for a number of years now is highly problematic. The low public confidence in government. Uh, a few weeks ago, CNN and Opinion Dynamics had a national public opinion survey 86% of Americans said they felt the federal government was broken, that the system simply was not uh, working. We could spend a lot of time diagnosing the problem. I'm sure everybody has particular ideas on what the exact nature of the problem is, but everybody basically agrees there is a problem. So I'd like to take uh, just a minute or uh, two just to talk about what we can do about it. Uh, because people are angry, they're upset, they feel frustrated from a variety of differing uh, political perspectives. What I want to do is kind of just talk about a few concrete things that I think people should think about doing that would help improve our system, make Congress more functional, and help to restore public confidence in government. Because if we don't get those things right, uh, none of this other stuff is uh, going to uh, matter. So for example, filibuster reform has to be at the top of the list. You know, when people talk about Congress being broken and what we can do about it. If, if I was going to, if I was the czar and could basically impose any one thing, the one thing that I would choose to do is to reform the filibuster rules. Because when the founders originally set up Congress, you know, they wanted it to be a deliberative body. They didn't want uh, Congress to kind of rush into any actions, but they never envisioned the filibuster as a way to stop legislation. They wanted it to slow down the process, so the process would be thoughtful, deliberative, a variety of differing points of view would come into the process, but this idea that you could basically hold up legislation for months and months at a time is contrary to the Constitution, it's uh, contrary to the intentions of our uh, founders. So you could reform the filibuster in a variety of differing ways. You could basically allow filibusters, but put some time uh, limits uh, on it. Uh, Tom Harkin, uh, the senator from Iowa, has a provision that over time the threshold starts to drop. Uh, they can filibuster for two weeks, and then after that, the threshold will drop from 60 to 57. You can filibuster a couple more weeks, the threshold then will drop to 54 or 55, and then eventually it comes down to 51. So it basically kind of lowers the threshold and imposes a time limit so that you can't use this procedural mechanism to stop legislation you uh, do not uh, like. So uh, that would be critical. Right now, senators can hold up presidential appointments. Just any one senator can put what's called a hold on that uh, uh, confirmation proceedings, which basically means the Senate cannot act as long as that hold is in place. President Obama has only 60% of his senior managers who are subject to the Senate confirmation process 
in place right now. This is more than a year into his presidency. He's not operating with his A-team because there are a lot of people in Treasury, in the State Department, and in other uh, federal departments who have not yet been confirmed by the Senate because senators have put hold, uh, holds on uh, them, which means the Senate is not able to act. And a lot of times, the holds have nothing to do with the individual merits of that individual. Uh, you know, a senator may want a new building uh, or some federal grant money for uh, his or her home state. And so they're basically engaging in extortion and holding that nominee hostage to uh, their own uh, parochial interest. That type of stuff has got to uh, come uh, to a stop. We need campaign finance reform. We could talk more if you'd like about the Supreme Court decision, uh, Citizens United, which is going to open the floodgate of corporate money into American politics. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, Congress can uh, pass some legislation to put some uh, limits on uh, that, because otherwise the 2010 election is going to be a wash in big corporate money, and it's going to have an impact on uh, what uh, happens. We need fair elections. We need to address the redistricting uh, process. So there are lots of things that people can do, and I applaud all of you for coming out very early on a Saturday morning and being interested in thinking about uh, steps that we can do. Um, the quick question I have before we go to Linda is, okay, how do we get rid of the filibuster rule? Do we need a filibuster-proof majority to do that? Well, unfortunately, to change any of the rules in the Senate actually requires 67 votes. Those are basically uh, the rules. And so if you really want to bring change to the Senate, you actually, uh, it does require an action uh, by the Senate, and it's going to take you know, at least uh, two thirds to either change the filibuster rule or change this requirement to make any rules changes, you need 67 votes. There are legislative uh, provisions that basically say the Senate should make its rules for the two year period uh, between elections. And then at the start of a new Senate, the Senate should be able to uh, make rules changes by a simple majority vote. Uh, which means that every two years, if there's a need to change the rules or tweak the process or raise the filibuster or lower the filibuster, that Senate would have the power to make the rules. Uh, and there's a group of uh, young people uh, in the Senate, there's an article in the Washington Post today about this, who are actually committed to doing this. This is not a partisan issue. I mean, right now, Democrats happen to have a big majority in the Senate. After the 2010 election, after the 2012 election, it's very conceivable Republicans may have a majority. When Republicans are back in charge, Democrats are going to be the ones engaging in procedural holds, obstructing the process, using the filibusters. Republicans will not be able to do anything uh, when they are uh, back in charge. So if there's ever an, an area where there should be bipartisan agreement between Democrats and Republicans, it should be on rules changes in the U.S. Senate. 